What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Drunk Fish Keeping. This is refreshing. Tonight's brew is a apple peach cider. Very delicious, and uh, I would definitely recommend it. Jack's is the name brand, and it's very good for a little bit of a different twang on your adventures in drunk fish keeping. So, tonight's video is about pests in the tank. I've done a video before on Aptasia, on how to control Aptasia and how to get rid of it. But this is not about Aptasia. This is about another pest that gets into your tank um, in a couple different ways. Now, this can come in through live rock, it can come in through coral, and it can come in through sand. Now, if you watch my channel and how I've set things up, this 120 gallon saltwater tank was set up sterile, and as sterile as you can get. What that means is the rock I got was dry rock, it was not live, it was not pulled out of a vat, it was not pulled out of someone else's tank. Same thing for the sand, and basically the water was the RODI, clean salt, nothing in it, you know, except for trace minerals. That was how I set this tank up. Um, and all my fish have done great, I really haven't had any fish uh, pest uh, or bacterial problems, knock on wood, um, no ick, things like that. What I have had to deal with though is some other pest problems and that's probably been brought in through some of the corals I brought in. This goes back into a really good topic about, oh, sorry, beer and tacos, America number one. Um, this goes back into quarantining your stuff. Um, some people can't quarantine. I get it. It's, it's hard, you know, depending on your space, budget. There's a couple of different constraints to keep you from being able to have a quarantine tank. Now I've done a video before, um, you can see it in you know, the feed about doing a quarantine tank, setting it up, how simple it is, how you set a quarantine tank up, how you dose for that, and how you keep you know, the fish healthy. And it's basically the same thing for corals or stuff like that. Um, so where did this come from? Where did this start? Sunday, you know, sitting down, you know, just kind of chilling, watching TV. Uh, Miss Adventures in Drunk Fish even goes, hey, your turban area looks pissed and I was like eh, okay I'm gonna, gonna take a look at it you know my, my coral never looks piss piss so I mean you know what is going on here so I looked at it she wasn't kidding my turban area looked pissed and I mean we're talking about a coral that normally has full polyp extension gorgeous coloration and no issues whatsoever now I've had this coral for probably going on a year and it's grown significantly. We we're talking about three inches of outer diameter growth in a year. So it's it's a growing healthy coral. What's the problem? Now, when I looked at it, I saw discoloration around the outside edge, and I saw a reduction of polyps across the coral, and on the outside, extreme reduction of polyps, showing skeletal structure. Now that's a problem. So I started looking up. Was there a particular you know, necrotic issue that comes up with these guys. Is there a particular flesh rotting issue? Mm, nah, I mean, there's stuff out there. Didn't fit the problem I had. So I started looking at my other corals, because I'm like, all right, let me let me take an inventory of what else in the tank. You feel you look good, as far as my hammers and my torch. My Duncan and my Blasto look good. My GSP look good, my leather look good. I'm like, okay, that's weird. Then I started looking at my ACAN. My A-can had some retraction on it too. I'm like, that doesn't look right. Because the A-can has grown two heads in the past month and a half. So I've had good growth. So where's the retraction coming from? And then I saw it. And I had to do a little research on these guys myself. But I'm going to show you where it's coming in at. So we're going to go down here to this zoanthid. And as you see, there's these little prongs sticking out all around and on this rock. And you can see back in here, there's more of them. Okay, so what are those? Those are vermited snails. Now, here's a couple things about these guys, if you're not familiar with this particular mollusk, is they are in the same mollusk family, you know, they're a fleshy snail that calcifies a shell. But instead of calcifying a shell that covers the body, allowing for movement across the tank like margaritas and trochus you know, and turbos and all those guys. These guys actually stick to a spot, usually on a hard substrate, 
they solidify to it and they grow a stalk, almost like a feather duster or a tube worm. Now here's where you get into some weirdness with them. These guys are filter feeders and they don't just feed easily. They send out a mucus net and that mucus net catches any type of proteins or ditrous in the tank and they catch it and they pull it back in for digestion. And you're thinking, okay, well how would that agitate your coral? Well, here's what the thing is. They like to attach to stony corals. So your LPS and your SPS, that's where you're gonna stick to. So your turbos, your acros, your montes, anything with a hard calcified skeletal structure, cup structure, that's where they stick or stick right around it. And when they do that, they agitate the coral. Now I'm gonna show you guys my turban area. Now this turban area I've had, like I said, for about a year. I got it when it was probably about a four to four and a half inch in outer diameter, and we're up to probably somewhere around the six to six and a half inch outer diameter range. Like it's a full handful of a piece of coral now. I'm gonna show you guys something. Okay, so I'm gonna pick this up. I'm gonna show you underneath. Now if you can see, Looks good, looks good. You see this spot? That wasn't like that probably a month ago. And this coral has done, like I said, a lot of growth. So guess what was attached underneath my turban area? A fermented snail. I had three of them on there actually, small ones, very small. We're talking, you know, the sharp end of a toothpick in size. So you're thinking to yourself like, well man, that can't cause that much problem. Oh yes, they can. Same thing on my A-can. I had three sprouting up under that one head of my A-can that reduced and retracted. And that worried me because I'm going, okay, I've got a problem. So I did some more research. And this required me to go onto some of the forums where some more experienced reef keepers were on there and kind of really go through the information on control of these critters. Now for the experienced reef keepers who maybe tune in this channel, I'm sure you guys went through this, so you guys kind of know this. And this is really for our new uh, introductory people into this hobby. There's a couple ways you can get rid of these guys. The time consuming but less detrimental of the tank way is tweezers or a pair of you know long stem needle noses. And what you do is you get down to the base the curled base of the snail and you crush and you pop off the rock. That'll kill the snail. If you only got a handful of these guys, take them out. If you've got rocks covered in them or a lot of them, it's not the best to take them all out at once because unless you have a huge system with a huge filtration system, you're gonna cause a spike because obviously you're putting a lot of dead flesh back in the system and that's gonna have to process out. So I would recommend doing maybe a rock's worth, waiting a night, a rock's worth, waiting a night, that's the way you can get them out slowly without having to starve the tank because like I said, they feed on the same stuff your coral feeds on and without having to do massive water changes and cleaning, cleaning, cleaning water because when you're doing a mixed reef tank, clean, clean water, it's not the best. You want seasoned clean water. Now for the experienced guys, you know what that means. For the newbies, seasoned clean water basically means that you have water that all parameters check out good, but as far as you did a trace test on it with all your minerals, the trace test comes out good. There's a slight bit of proteins in there, enough for, to keep everything happy, keep all your you know, zoology happy, or zoo, excuse me, zooplankton happy, keep everything and everything that works in tandem with the coral for growth happy. Um, and that's like with me, I dose reef snow, zooplankton, and trace elements once a week just to give these guys a boost in feeding. And I do water changes limited, but with heavy protein skimming and regular filter sock changes to keep the nitrates down, along with large amounts of you know carbon, purge, and things like that. So that's how I keep my water clean, but seasoned, if that makes sense. Um, and I can do a whole video on that at some point. If you guys wanna see that, you know, post it down in the comments, say, hey, I wanna kinda of see what you're talking about. And part of these videos is me kind of giving you guys this information in a more, you know, fun, easy to digest format. So the other two methods of killing these things out of your tank, not the best, not recommended, but I'm gonna tell you about them just because that's part of how I do this. So I like to give everybody the information. 
you got two other options. You can pull your rock out of the tank. If that have coral attached to it, you can pull it out and you can basically throw it in fresh water for a couple of days. It's gonna pretty much kill it. You can boil it or you can dip it in a hydrochloric acid solution. Now the hydrochloric acid solution is if you got a piece of rock that is just, just covered and you know there is no way getting around it. That kills everything in the rock. Beneficial bacteria, it kills snails, crap, anything that's in that rock is dead at that point. It is, is dead, it's gone. You're basically taking whatever piece of rock out and you're throwing it to the side and saying, I, I just, I'm gonna sterilize this rock completely and work it back in. Now, if you are like me and have some backup rock in your sump, that is a backup chunk of live rock for situations like this, that's good. If you're someone who has a smaller tank or doesn't have a sump or has like say, a, you know, some like the Innovator Marine, like you're, you're all in one inclusive aquariums that don't have the room for that, you don't have that option unless you got a vat of live rock floating around, which some people do, some people don't. So the total nuclear option is only if you are absolutely up against the wall. And honestly, I would not handle hydrochloric acid if you've never dealt with it at all for a hobbyist if you've never dealt with it because the stuff will burn you. So that is like one of those things I would say is a absolute um, kind of last case scenario. I'm gonna nuke this thing option. I don't care anymore. I want it gone out of my tank. Um, and even then, you're never gonna truly get rid of it all the way unless you pull every rock out, which basically means you're scrapping all beneficial bacteria in the tank. So that's kind of not the way I go. I'd go with the crush method, crush, you know, work it through, give it you know, some rest, work it, give it some rest, and just keep your eye on it and, and keep it maintained. And that comes into part of the, the maintenance that may come up with a tank. Um, that is one of the things that I guess is fun and yet aggravating about the hobby, um, is that there are maintenance periods like this where you'll go a month with basically doing a regular water change algae cleaning and, and feeding and your tank looks amazing to where you know you get the, you know people come over to your house and they're like oh man your tank looks great oh my god this looks great i want one of these in my house or whoo can't believe you you know the other hobbyist man i can't believe you got this kind of fish or this kind of coral doing so well that makes the you know the hobby fun but then you got this maintenance part of it um and that like i said kind of makes it a bit difficult sometimes because you you want all the benefit and the, the coolness of it but it, the work part of it comes in this is the work part um and like i said even to me someone who's been in the hobby for a while that was something that kind of threw me for a loop because i was like looks like i got feather dusters they weren't feather dusters so i'm learning the hard way sometimes going against your gut instinct of that looks fine is to go hmm that doesn't look right let me look into it because I could have caught this problem a month ago and been ahead of the game before I saw, you know, it affecting my coral. So now I've got to clean and then redose and you know, help to grow my coral back out. Um, last thing in this video, I know I, I told you guys about doing the, the freshwater little uh, nano cube that I did. That nano cube is just about done cycling. Um, I'm going to do a video on it because I've actually changed a couple things up from how it come from. Uh, out of the box, you know, change the light, change filters, uh, basically completely change everything except the box of water itself. So that's gonna be fun. Um, I'm gonna show you guys the stocking that I'm doing for that. Hopefully, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the tank too. That will be cycled out and ready to go in the next day or two so I can stock it and show you guys what I wanna do. Um, I'll do a video on that probably by the end of the week. Again, questions, comments, put them down below. Like I said, I do this for the fun of it just so you guys can get information on doing your tanks in a more easy to enjoy format but as always enjoy your adventures in drunk fish keeping this is always refreshing and like the channel and subscribe and if you see anything you guys want to add or want to see in content put them down in the comments below i keep attention to this so i can give you guys the best content i can as always enjoy your adventures in drunk fish keeping